Uh, Mr. Sweeney, for an, uh, um, allowing me to come and give the uh, talk uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. It's, this is the 50th anniversary of To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee's classic. And I thought it would only be fitting uh, to at least give some recognition to it, given the, given the fact that this is the 50th anniversary of uh, such an American classic. Um, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to look at the book lately, but obviously this is the newest, uh, this is the classic edition of the book, uh, the latest edition. There are several versions of it. The covers you know, obviously vary and change over time, but this is the most recent version. And, there, and there's another one. <laughs> and there's the paperback version is slightly different, but this is the hardback cover of the most recent issue of To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee as well. And afterwards, I'll be talking about uh, several impacts uh, 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 of the, what the novels had on American society, and then I will entertain any. Sorry, I still can't. Okay, we'll see. This is all here. It's not coming through. The voice is not coming through. Okay. Try again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Don't shoot my back. Okay. As I said, there will be, um, I'll be talking about the book and giving uh, various, thank you, thank you, uh, talking about various aspects of the book and uh, Harper Lee's life. And then afterwards, I'll be happy to entertain any questions you may have in regards to uh, Harper Lee, the book, or whatever aspects of To Kill a Mockingbird you want to discuss, okay? It is probably one of the very few novels that the majority of Americans, regardless of race, class, gender, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, geographic region, or generation have heard of. In fact, talk show host Oprah Winfrey refers to it as, quote, America's novel. I would argue that this is an accurate description of Harper Lee's to classic, literary classic To Kill a Mockingbird. This reflective, intense, suspenseful, and engaging novel published in 1960 received the 1961 Pulitzer Prize for fiction. While this would be a significant honor for any writer, what made this accomplishment even more impressive was the fact that this was Lee's first book. Talk about winning the lottery or beginning beginner's luck. She definitely hit the jackpot. What is even more incredible to note is the fact that The Killer Mockingbird is still very much relevant more than a half a century later. According to Mary McDonough Murphy, author, author of Scout, Atticus, and Boo, the book still sells more than one million copies per year. This is more than J.D. Salinger's hip early Cold War 1951 classic Catcher in the Rye, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, or John Zombeck's late 1930s riveting account of the Great Depression novel, The Grapes of Wrath. Each are spellbinding books within their own right. All of these novels are perennial favorites of more than a few high school English teachers and literature lovers in general. No other 20th century American novels more widely read. Even across the Atlantic in England, when numbers of British librarians were polled and asked the question, which book should everyone read before they die? To Kill a Mockingbird came in at number one. The Bible was the runner up at number two. When asked why there was such a strong reaction to Harper Lee's novel, a number of people argued that, quote, the book is a substantial piece of work and gives the reader, quote, something to believe in without being too preachy. As someone who is a member of Generation X, meaning those of us who were born between 1965 and 1978, although the dates vary according to what dem dem demographers you talk to, I actually did not read To Kill a Mockingbird until the early 1990s when I was a graduate student at the University of Delaware in Newark. When it came to reading the book, I was a Johnny come lately, you could say. Although I was a history major, I had heard so much about the book from several people that I knew, I felt that I had to pacify my curiosity and thus decided to purchase a copy of the book from one of the local bookstores on Main Street in downtown Newark. For the record, I am not a person who reads much fiction, at least voluntarily unless I've been convinced that the work is being, being discussed is worth the time to read. In short, I can honestly tell you that I was not disappointed. My expectations were indeed satisfied. Harper Lee's characters were emotional, varied, vibrant, multifaceted, tormented, conflicted, and filled with contradictions. What was even more surprising to me was the fact that despite the book was fiction, she was able to so deftly, aptly, and sophisticatedly provide an accurate portrayal of small town life in the years of the Great Depression in the Deep South. Racial strife, economic stratification, wanton violence, mental illness, helplessness, grotesque exploitation of workers by indifferent and hostile employees, and grand levels of despair were just a few of the misfortunes that plagued much of America, especially poor and other disenfranchised America, a large number of who lived in the Deep South at the time. As someone who is a historian by training, the fact that she was able to present such an accurate portrait of life during this most challenging era in our nation's history 
was indeed very impressive to me. Moreover, it may become to the realization that history could also be employed as a very useful tool for writing fiction. Even now, more importantly, a number of years later, as a professor who teaches in the humanities and social sciences, it may be aware that the novel is a classic liberal arts text and that it transcends across academic disciplines. The book can be employed in English, history, sociology, American studies, women's studies, and cultural studies courses. It has also been read in a number of philosophy, psychology, and ethics studies courses. This demonstrates its broad range of diversity. While the novel examines the first third of the 20th century, it was written in the summer, it was written in the summer of 1960. 1960 was a significant year in many respects. It was during this summer of, the, summer of this year that the birth control pill was released on the market to American women. Those of us who study history are all, all, are all well aware of the social, political, and cultural impact that this event had on American society, and millions of American women in particular. On the television front, it was also Gunsmoke, was the number one show on television. It was also on CBS, which at that time was the most powerful network on TV. The Democratic nominee for president that year was a handsome, dashing, early 40-ish Massachusetts senator of Irish Catholic heritage named John Fitzgerald Kennedy. His opponent was a middle-aged, plain-looking, yet very intelligent vice president from California by the name of Richard Milhouse Nixon. Also that year, a novel written by Alan Drury entitled Advice and Consent that dealt with the life of, of Secretary of State nominee, who had early in his career had ties to the Communist Party, became the best-selling fiction book of the year. It was also the summer that a young black woman from Clarksville, Tennessee, named Wilma Rudolph, nicknamed, quote, the Black Gazelle by the media, won three gold medals at the Olympics in Rome. It was a new decade. 1960 was also a time when racial segregation was still legal in much of America, including Harper Lee's home state of Alabama. Civil disobedience and lunch counter set-ins were very much in their infancy. As someone who was born during the height of the modern civil rights movement in 1967, called by myself, also known as the Long Hot Summer, due to the many race riots that were taking place in many urban areas of the nation, I and my generation was spared having to deal with the brash, blatant type of racism that was so widespread at the time. In fact, Scott Turo, author of the 1988 bestseller Presumed Innocent, remarked, quote, People forget how denied this nation was. The animosity to the Civil Rights Act, which probably would not have been passed had John F. Kennedy had not been assassinated, and it became his legacy. But that was 1963. In 1960, there were no laws guaranteeing that African Americans could enter any restaurant, any hotel, or any other form of public facilities. We did not have those laws. In that world, for Harper Lee to speak out the way she did was remarkable." End of quote. Moreover, at this time, you had Governor of Alabama, and I am getting to some issues, but I'll give you a background so you'll see why I'm setting this up. <laughs> Moreover, at the time, governor, uh, the governor of Alabama, George Wallace, uh, who was a staunch segregationist, coined, for, who coined the famous or infamous comment, quote, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever, end, end of quote. He also stood in front of the schoolhouse door refusing to integrate the University of Alabama. The fact is that George Wallace was an opportunistic politician who acclimated to the segregationist sentiments of the pre-1970 South in an effort to expedite his own political career. However, it eventually caught up with him in 1972 when he was shot, fortunately, and paralyzed. This was also a time when there was unprecedented levels of violence that raged to the Deep South. Bombings, lynchings, and murders were commonplace. I am certain that some of you, if not most of you, are aware of the story of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama in September 1963 that took the life of four little girls who were attending Sunday school. Their murder shocked and angered the nation. Paradoxically, it was also a time when black people were beginning to earn union wages in steel mills and other professions. Black military veterans came home from military service, went to school, got good jobs, and started building houses for their families. A number of these homes were dynamited by whites in the late 1950s. To Kill a Mockingbird gives us the background of this horrific environment. The book also gave us hope that in spite of such grave infractions, justice could prevail. This is one of the many multiple interpretations that one can take from the novel. Indeed, one can interpret many meanings from To Kill a Mockingbird. At this point, we're talking about Southern life and racial injustice. When the book was released, many critics described it as a Southern regional romantic novel. The first part deals primarily with the children's fascination with Boo Radley and their feelings of safety. It is probably safe to say that many people, I was one of them, was very impressed with Scout and Jim's observation of their high-strung neighbors. Lee does an excellent job of displaying to the reader a very painstakingly detailed account of the Finch's family history, as well as the history of Macomb. The theme of Southern regionalism is further seen in the fact that Mayella Ewell's inability to acknowledge the fact that she has made a number of advances toward Tom Robinson, and Scout's definition of, quote, fine folks, 
being people with good sense who do the best they can with what they have. It is an accurate representation of the Depression era South. The second half of the novel primarily deals with the less than humane treatment of the supposedly uh, the less humane treatment of Southern white Southerners toward Negroes. In fact, in the initial years following its release, many scholars and critics argued that To Kill a Mockingbird was a novel that offered a gut-wrenching depiction of race relations. There are those who argue that the novel was a response to Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat to a white pastor in Montgomery, Alabama in December 1955. Others say that it was a culmination, culmination pardon me, of racial events that had taken place throughout the South and its tumultuous history that resided in Harper Lee's novel, resulted in Harper Lee's novel. Assumptions aside, this is not to say that everyone was pleased with the book. A few critics attack her for what they saw as the patronizing, simplification, and retrograde stereotypes of poor white Southerners and one-dimensional and simplistic black characters. In all fairness to Lee, given the fact that she was born in the Deep South and was a middle to upper class Southerner and a deeply economic stratified South, she most likely had limited, if any, contact with blacks except those that may have worked for her, or many poor whites for that matter. Thus, she wrote from what her limited experiences provided her. Whatever her motives, there was no question that Harper Lee struck a major chord with many Americans with her searing, graphic, and depictions of racial injustice. Class is also a factor in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. It was evident throughout her novel that Harper Lee was a Southerner who aggressively challenged the status quo of a deeply segregated South. The character and worth of the individual took precedence over a person's social standing. The Finches are upper, middle, upper income Southerners who are not spared her occasional indignation or wrath. This is seen when Scout humiliates one of her poor classmates in, her, in their the Finch's home. Such behavior, behavior annoys Calpurnia, the Finch's black housekeeper, and she punishes Scout for doing so. While Atticus, Scout's father, has no problem with Calpurnia disciplining his daughter, not everyone is pleased by her assertiveness or aggressiveness. To some people, Calpurnia, Calpurnia has become, quote, uppity and has, quote, forgotten her place. This is evident in the conversation that takes place between Atticus and his sister Alexandria, Alexandria Department, who strongly encouraged him to fire Calpurnia, for which he refuses to do so. Thus, for Lee, obedience, courtesy, and respect for individuals takes precedence over their socioeconomic status. Indeed, we see the various class status of various individuals throughout the novel. In fact, Atticus tells his children not to judge any individual until they have walked a mile in that person's skin. Courage and compassion are also central themes of such a novel and gender as well. While Harper Lee does a solid job exposing the blatant and grotesque racism that is very much prevalent in the Depression era South, she also does an admirable job in demonstrating how sexism was very much a part of the region, of life in the region. An example of this is when Scout realizes what being female means and how several other female characters influence her development. Scout's close identification with her father and older brother allows her to describe the variety and depth of female characters in the novel, both as an active participant while simultaneously serving as an outside observer. Scout's primarily female role models are Calpurnia and her neighbor, Miss Baldy. Both of these women are aggressive, independent, and very paternalistic on a number of levels. Another female character, Miela Ewo, has a perverse level of influence when she destroys an innocent man in order to disguise her true admiration for him. What is interesting, what is also interesting, is the, number that, uh, is the fact that a number of fellow female characters are critical of Scout for being such a tomboy and refusing to adopt a more feminine, upscale, Southern Belle, ladylike persona. In many cases, these are also the women that represent the most races and classes viewpoints, ironically. An example of this is where Mrs. Dubois chastises Scout for, wearing a, for not wearing a dress and further informs her that she is damaging the family name by not doing so, yet also insults Atticus simultaneously for deciding to represent Tom Robinson. These are some examples that demonstrate the ambivalence of being female, especially white, upscale, and female in the South at this time. Absent parents are also another theme in the novel. As any reader of To Kill a Mockingbird is aware, Scout's mother dies before Scout remembers her. Mayella's mother is dead. In fact, with the exception of Atticus, the rest of the fathers depicted in the novel are physically or verbally abusive. Ambiguous or an overt hints of child molestation, alcoholism, and other social vices are discussed by Lee. Men like Bob Ewell and Mr. Bradley epitomize the dishonest, perverted, angry, unethical type of masculinity that differs from the noble, requisite, honorable representation of manhood displayed by Atticus. Another profound point that Harper Lee suggests is that such sexual double standards and hypocrisy can impose severe limitations on society. Atticus Finch is also a central character in the novel and the legal profession. One of the most lasting impacts of to kill, to kill a, that To Kill a Mockingbird has had on the American conscience is a strong moral compass and unprecedented level 
and of integrity demonstrated by Atticus Finch. Atticus Finch has been adopted by many in the legal profession as the example of the all attorneys that all attorneys should aspire to and emulate. In fact, the character has been so revered by so many people that he's been treated as an actual human being by some. Civil rights lawyer Morris D. stated that the character was the reason he decided to become an attorney, a lawyer. Although the character is widely liked, he has his detractors. Critics of Atticus Finch argue that although he was liberal, that he nonetheless worked in a system where institutionalized racism and sexism were rampant, and thus he should not be exalted in the manner that he has. Other detractors argue that he did not use his legal skills to challenge the deeply segregated status quo, racist status quo in his hometown of Macomb. Truth be told, such misguided comments demonstrate a chronic lack of historical awareness and an alarming degree of detachment from reality. Anyone who was adequately aware of life in the Deep South and much of the nation during the 1930s would realize that it was impractical and virtually impossible for one man, no matter how conscientious and well-intentioned, to single-handedly reform an overhaul system that was vehemently ingrained in mires and centuries of hate, rigid culture and mores and customs and other deeply entrenched racist values. Rather, if anything, Atticus should be commended for being as forward and as brave as he was in representing a poor, disenfranchised black man in an environment where there was no competitive advantage for him to do so. I also wonder how many of these smug, self-righteous critics of Atticus would actually have been brave as he was at the time, or even today, or much later in our integrated 21st century America. Hollywood also looked at Kill a Mockingbird in a number of areas. The book was made into a movie on Christmas Day in 1962. It was released. It was not made. It was released in 1962. Uh, the opening sequence of the movie, marbles, crayon drawings, and toys were striking. Anybody remember that scene where you see the opening the Killer Mockery remember that scene <laughs> where he's in it, that automatic that captivates you as well? Exactly. Uh, the Horton Foot, the late Horton Foot wrote the screenplay. The film grossed more than $20 million, which at that time was massive. It was at that time was massive. The film received eight Academy Award nominations and went on to win three awards. One for a Best Adapted Screenplay, a Best Actor Academy Award for Gregory Peck, and one for set art, and set uh, art and Set Decoration, which was not surprising in any of those categories. Even today, almost 50 years later, it still has the same staying power it did when it was first released. Over the last 20 years, the, films, the film has appeared on various American Film Institute's list. It was, ranked the number two, it was ranked number two on the best American films of all time in 2006, right behind It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. Atticus Finch was voted the greatest number one hero of the century in the 20th century in 2003. Harper Lee herself, despite the phenomenal success of the novel, Harper Lee was never totally comfortable with her sudden fame. In fact, she has not granted a public interview since 1964, nor has she written any other works, although she did read, well, she wrote some, she wrote, pardon me, she wrote some uh, articles for magazines and short, uh, you know, um, critic, critic uh, commentary pieces, but no, no other novel since that time. This is also the year 1964 when she stated in an interview with author Jean Blackhell that, quote, she wanted to be, quote, the Jane Austen of South, of South Alabama, end of quote. She quoted, she wanted to be the Jane Austen of South Alabama. It was not long afterwards that she quickly withdrew from the public arena, refusing to grant any interviews. Even Oprah Winfrey was unable to secure an interview with the reclusive author. To quote in, uh, Winfrey, who had had lunch with Lee in 2006, quote, I knew 20 minutes into the interview that I would never be able to convince her to an interview. Nevertheless, we were like instant girlfriends. It was just wonderful, and I love being with her. End of quote. There has been much speculation as to why Lee has refused to grant any interviews, any interviews for more than four decades. Some of the reasons are plausible. Given the fact that she is now in her mid-80s and has suffered a mild stroke, it would make sense that she would be reluctant to grant too many, if any, interviews. One major reason that inquiring fans of Lee State as her decision not to write another book was that the phenomenal success and attention given to To Kill a Mockingbird was too overwhelming for a small-town woman who was used to a more controlled lifestyle, free of inquisitive reporters. Other Lee fans believe that given the novel, that the novel was so successful, winning the Pulitzer Prize as well as several other awards during that year, made into a major Hollywood movie, lauded with lavish praise and widely heralded nationally as well as internationally as a triumphant work in many literary circles, psychologically paralyzed Lee to the point that she was unwilling or unable to make the effort to produce another manuscript that might not live up to the astonishing level of her inaugural book. Although she did write a number of essays and short stories, as I told you earlier. The latter observation is not totally without merit. However, it may not be entirely true. To be sure, Harper Lee is not the first person who only wrote one novel and little if anything else. One can look at Ralph Ellison, who wrote Invisible Man, the book that won the 1953 American Book Award. He's also the first black American to win the honor. Outside of a few short stories, Ellison wrote nothing else up until his death until 1994. His long-awaited novel, Juneteenth, was completed by another author and published posthumously. 
The Killer Mockingbird is also known for spectacular quotes in many, uh, at least depending on how you look at them, very, very uh, memorable quotes that stay with the reader. They stay, stay with me anyway. While To Kill a Mockingbird was very engaging and colorful in its use of language and imagery, there were some quotes that were so striking and noble, noble, notable that they deserve further acknowledgement. One such quote was, quote, they're certainly entitled to think and they're entitled to full respect for their opinions. But before I can live with other folks, I've got to live with myself. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. That was spoken by Atticus. He further says, I wanted, quote, I wanted you to see what real courage is. Instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand, it's when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. End of quote by Atticus, chapter 11. Depends on the version of, of the book you have, I guess. <laughs> but uh, chapter 11. Another quote, um, when he was nearly 13, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed and Jim's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about this industry. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right. When he stood or walked, the back of his head was at right angles to his body, his thumb parallel to his thigh. He couldn't have cared less, so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintain that the evil started it all, but Jim, who was, but Jim, who was four years my senior, said to start long before that. He said it began in the summer Dill came out to us. When Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Bradley come out, end the quote. Does anybody know what, that's, what part, of the book, the part of the book that was? Very exactly. <laughs> good, 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 good. Exactly. That in itself, such a direct opening, introduction automatically embraces the reader to continue turning the pages. Another quote, profound quote, at least to me, quote, Atticus took off his coat, Atticus, pardon me, Atticus took his coat off the back of his chair and pulled it over his shoulder. Then he left the courtroom, but not by his usual exit. He must have wanted to go home the short way because he walked quickly down the middle toward the south exit. I followed to the top of his head as he made his way to the door. He did not look out, up. Someone was punching me, but I was reluctant to take my eyes from the people down below, below us and the image of Atticus as lonely walk down the aisle. Miss Jean Louise, I looked around. They were standing, all of us all around in the balcony and on the opposite side of the wall. The Negroes were getting to their feet. Reverend Sykes' voice was as distant as Judge Taylor's. Miss Jean, Miss Jean Louise, stand, your father's passing. Spoken by Scout. That, and I thought, was a very, very profound quote, and that's toward the end of the novel, the latter parts of the novel, but I thought it, it demonstrated the unconditional love and admiration that the black townspeople had for Mr. Finch, because he gave it his best efforts as well. Um, a number of authors, celebrities, and journalists have also been enchanted with To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, uh, the public figures have commented about the impact, a number of them have commented about the impact that the book has had on their individual lives. Um, all of us probably have a favorite character or characters in the novel. It is probably safe to say that for most of us, Addison and Scott were the two that leave the most impressionable and indelible impressions on the readers, whether they were your favorites or not. They're the ones who are uh, probably certainly the central part of the novel. Uh, for me, it was Atticus personally. Um, however, I will read some quotes from a number of public figures describing their opinions of Scout and Atticus. First of all, with Scout, these are the comments from a number of public figures and their impressions of the character Scout and Atticus. Scout first. Scout is irresistible. Tom Brokaw, our journalist and author of The Greatest Generation. Quote, when I was a kid, I collected insurrectionary, outspoken, not girly girls in books. Anne of Green Gables, Joe Marsh and Little Women, and Scout and To Kill a Mockingbird. Anna Quinlan, author and journalist. Quote, I fell in love with Scout. I wanted to be Scout. I thought I was Scout. Oprah Winfrey, talk show host, actress, philanthropist. Quote, I felt so attached to her, I just wish I could have been as smart as Scout. Quote, Mary Badham, the actress who played Scout. Quote, I love the fact that she was a little smart ass. She speaks first with her fist and has to back up three or four steps. She is sort of similar to a character in Huckleberry Finn in that she pokes at the boundaries of good taste and what is proper. Quote, Wally Lamb, author of several books. Quote, she does not have a mother. In many ways, her childhood is very lonely, and it's her interest in other people that makes it a full childhood. She truly struggles like many adults to find their place in this world. Quote, Lizzie Skernick, blogger and cultural critic. Quote, here is Scout who believes in things, who is funny and is curious and passionate and a tomboy. And I think the Scout has done more for Southern womanhood than any other character in literature. Lee Smith, author and retired professor. Quote, she's a scamp, hysterically funny and no less funny as an adult looking back although in a slightly more fermented and seasoned way, 
and she was great company. David Kippen, former director of literature for the Endowment of the Arts. Quote, one of the reasons I never liked Scout, uh, was that one of the reasons I liked Scout, pardon me, was that she never went over to the quote, dark side of being a girly girl. Anna Quinlan. <laughs> quote, Scout is a child who sees the world as an adult. She sees the world through a child's eyes, but with an adult's understanding. Quote, James McBride, author. Atticus Finch, responses to Atticus Finch. Quote, for me, Atticus Finch represents a generation of intelligent white lawyers who eventually in the 1950s and 60s became federal judges that changed the South. Really, without them, we would not have had a civil rights movement. Quote, Andrew Young, former congressman from Georgia. Quote, Atticus Finch was a citizen in a town who saw wrong and moved to right it, despite what his neighbors thought. It was beyond him to trying to do the right thing. He knew God was watching, and so he was trying to get into heaven, James McBride. Quote, who doesn't want a father like Atticus Finch? Atticus Finch was a father maybe I longed for. Richard Russo, author. Quote, the beautiful intimacy between Atticus and Scout that you just want to get inside, and it gives you a feeling of so much love and comfort and integrity. Its beauty never ceases to amaze me and strike me. Roseanne Cash, singer and author. Quote, something about the father-daughter relationship aided me in all of my father and daughter stuff. This is a there is a quintessential American family, although it is not typical. Richard Russo. Not only is Atticus this wonderful father, completely inviting and caring, but even he is the best shot in the county. Scott Tyrrell, author and attorney. Let's talk about the scene when he shoots that. <laughs> you know that scene. Talking about. Uh, Harper Lee still resides in her hometown of Alabama. She is 85 years old. She has weathered the struggle, as I said earlier, and lives is living day to day. Over the past decade, she has received several honorary awards. In 2002, she received one from the University of the South here in Sawani, uh, in Tennessee. Uh, in 2006, she received an honorary doctorate from Notre Dame, where she, each graduating senior held a copy of the novel in her hands as they gave her a standing ovation for her contribution to American literature. In 2007, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by former President George Bush, who also praised both Lee and the novel. While she has not written any other works since the groundbreaking triumph, Harper Lee has provided America with a great gift and national treasure. There is no doubt that To Kill a Mockingbird will continue to be read by succeeding generations of students and adults for years to come. To paraphrase Oprah Winfrey, it is indeed one of the signature American novels. Thank you. At this, at this point, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. About the book. I've, I came with the knowledge, some of you who have not read the book will have uh, some of those characters I mentioned, Cal Perny and Adam, that'll fill in the blanks for you, but most of you, I came, that you would come to this talk, I assume that you're familiar with the book, so some of those people I mentioned, you would know, but if you haven't, this has prompted you to go back and read the book, so you'll, <laughs> so you'll be familiar with those characters, and I've given you some background. But at this point, I'll be happy to take any uh, questions. Well, what is your take on uh, the author's withdrawal in the in the 60s? I, I think um, I think there was a lot of in fact some of those as I mentioned in, in, in uh, referring to other people I think that, I do believe in some cases I think she probably was a person who was very uh, small town life you know grew up in a small town probably a relatively uh, had comfort zone, so to speak, you know, the way life didn't change too much in that time and and I think you know you can imagine that if any of us wrote a book all of a sudden, and then you realize, you know, it gets all this acclaim, it gets the Pulitzer Prize, you know, and, you know, it's made into a movie, you know, you're called by every literary agent all throughout the world, you know, see, you know everybody wants to talk to you on this, and so you can imagine today, when even then, you had ABC, CBS, and NBC, and a few shows, now you've got, what, you know, MSNBC, Fox, and you got, you know, see, I mean, now you even have more of a, just a, more of a blitz, and then you can imagine the, um, overwhelming uh, response that could be for somebody who might be a relatively private person, which I think she is, uh, of by all indications. So I do think I can imagine, you know, and also too, I think after three years of, up until 1964, you know, she probably figured she probably said everything that could be said about the book. And why I repeat myself again, you know, and I think that, uh, and also then she could be um, very, it could also be very shrewd on her part. You know, a lot of times the fact that nobody's talking about the book, and nobody sees her interviewing, but people talk about the book, that also keep, probably kept sustained interest in it. Because maybe she was smart enough to realize that she was constantly out in the public every by 19, you know, after a while, you know, then she wouldn't be as, as, much, as much of a novelty. And I think the fact that you have people talk, so like J.D. Salinger, Catcher the Rye, who I mentioned early on, the fact that he was reclusive after that, you know, he never gave any interviews and other people always speculating whether he was writing, what was going on with his book. I think the fact that that curiosity probably even prompted more of a mystique around her. And then, you know, I think they were able to, um, you know, sell book, more books as opposed to being out in the public all the time. All the time. This doesn't mean they wouldn't sell well, but I don't think it would have the same impact. I think that mystique was more important. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Something to lose. Hmm. Absolutely. Potentially, right, right. And I think, you know. I've also read something, though, a quote from her 
fairly recently where she denied that she was a recluse. And she said she just stayed at home and lived her life and she didn't seek publicity. But she <laughs> declined that, you know, that she refused to give up. That she said that that was a myth that grew up around her. Perhaps when she's been getting some of these recent honors and some of the stuff that's come out in the literature, she was a little bit more public. She said she did not refuse to give up. That they just quit. It also depends on how. It also depends on how we define recluse. How we define recluse, you know. So, you know, I'm sure she's, you know, she probably traveled and lived life like many other ordinary Americans. But um, right, right, right. I thought that was very interesting. But I also think too, but by but that mystique could all, you know, that that you know that recluse, the perceived recluse, could also be her uh, weapon to, you know, to keep her mystique going too. So I think that you know, you know, as well. Any other questions? Any other questions or comments? Yes. Um, I was puzzled that you hadn't read it till what, 1990? No, 1991, graduate school. Yeah, I was a latecomer to it. So I gather that, that it means that the black community really didn't kind of adopt that book as kind of a hopeful sign, you know, during the 60s. See, I was in high school during the 60s. Mm -hmm. and we had a lot of race riots in Rochester, New York. And mm -hmm. So it, you know, it was very fresh in my mind, uh, mm -hmm. even though I'm I knew nothing about the South, and I hadn't realized, you know, just how much worse everything was <coughs> in the South. But, um, but you know, in in my mind, I would have thought the black community would have embraced that book as, as a sign maybe to their children to, that you know don't give up. You know, that was, yeah, I think it depends on who you look. I think I mean there are some literature professors and people like that who looked at it, but I think there were also uh, many segments of the black community who were also, um, as I said, somewhat some people were critical of it because they thought that black characters were one-dimensional and they, you know, spoke in broken English and didn't seem to be very. It kind of reemerged stereotypes. But I said, in all fairness to Harper Lee, you got to look at the world she was talking about, and also in the Great Depression in the 1930s and the world she grew up in in South Alabama. So I think you have to look at her world as opposed to, I think there were some blacks who thought of models a throwback. And also many people who were, who thought it didn't reflect well on poor whites. <laughs> or even some, you know, some, some people think it looked good on men, all except for Atticus. You know, so, I mean, there were a lot of people that she, a lot of people thought they were, were critical, to, you know, felt there were a number of groups that she really targeted, you know, women and, who were, you know, racist, whether it was sexist men, you know. Um, but there were a lot of people felt the book was also, but the book was also dealing about the growing the Great Depression when there was a lot of despair and there were poor people, disenfranchised people and did not have a lot. Uh, not necessarily their own circumstances going for them. So it was only sensible to move, that the book was going to deal with people who are, you know, on the dark, who look at the dark side of human nature and the dark side of life. But I think there were a number of African Americans who did not um, necessarily review the book. I mean, in retrospect now, a lot of people, you know, were looking at it and saying, you know, how, you know, how uh, right on the, the situation Harper Lee was. But at initially at that time, you could imagine the book would not be received well, given what was going on in America at that particular time. You could see in the latest, in, you know, throughout the 1960s and stuff, that would have been very, very, um, because African Americans are fighting to move forward, and I think a lot of people might saw this book as, you know, kind of throwing people backwards, or certainly romanticizing the past, which was not our case. But I think people could perceive that, you know. Right. So I think I'm pretty good. Um, did you grow up up north? Delaware. Okay. Um, and while you were going through school, uh, even though that had won the Pulitzer Prize, Delaware. Surprised. It wasn't on any school reading list of literature. Actually, um, it was um, a very. It was not on any school. I, as an undergrad at college, the classes I took it was not required. Um, um, and I, high school, I never uh, was required to read it. Like I said, and um, this is uh, there were people who I'd heard students, other fellow high school students, who talked about it and everything else um, as well. But I know none of our none of the English teachers that I had in high school. Um, you know, required it, you know, and I was on. Um, I actually talked to my dad, my dad, who's the deceased now, my dad died in the late 90s, but um, my father was a high school principal, and I said, how come you, <laughs> you should have asked for the English teachers, how come they didn't require it in class, you know, <laughs> so to speak, but um, I did not read it until I got into uh, graduate school at the University of Delaware, like I said, but in some ways, I think maybe the fact that I did not read it until I got into my early 20s might have even been better for me, because I think I came away with a more mature uh, look at it, so to speak, as if I'd read it as a teenager, you know, as well. We were required to read it. Um, I was a freshman in high school that kind of came out, and mm -hmm. I came out with, with my sophomore junior year. Um, but <clears throat> I guess um, what puzzles me is it's now on supposedly a, a, a list of 100, the 100 banned books or something. 
there were people who tried to ban it initially. You know, in the '80s in particular, there was a lot of banning, of potential banning of books. But um, you know, Huckleberry Finn was another one. You know, because of the language and so the you know. So it was mostly just because it, if you don't take it the right way, it, it could look like a slam against. Well, I think for different books for various reasons. There are a lot of people who looked at uh, in the '80s. You know, some of them. Uh, you know, it was it was it was it was an attack on the First Amendment. I mean, none of the books were banned. There was an attempt to try to ban them. Obviously, there would be there would there would be a very chilling effect on the First Amendment to do something like that. You know, so you know, a major attack. But there were efforts to try to ban. You know, the Kill a Mockingbird, Huckleberry Finn, um, uh, Mice and Men, or several others. There were there were a number of books they were trying to um, ban because of some people did not like the the language or the use of certain words. And I think, you know, when you, when you start going around trying to do that and, you know, trying to censor things, well, you pretty much you've trampled on the First Amendment. So I think, that, you know, so I don't think anybody would ever, uh, some people may support it, but I'll, I can never see anything like that passing. I'd be when I dare fight against that because I don't think no matter whether you like it in literature or word or not, you know, you either have free speech or you don't. And when you start banning books, then you might as well just say, you know, yeah, that's it. I think a lot of those, uh, <laughs> Banning attempts happen at school libraries where you yes. know, people, there'll be an argument that it's not age appropriate. And that, you know, uh, youngsters shouldn't be reading things like that. Well, that, is, that ends up increasing the statistical ratio of the, many, the amount of times that a book has been challenged and banned. And uh, <laughs> I will come to that. That's where a lot of that's happened. I, I did have another question. Sure. Uh, I've read recently a sort of a mini controversy came up that uh, some people claim that. Truman Capote, who she was childhood friends with, and a lot of friends with, I think, uh, goes read the book. Now, I looked into that, and I don't believe that's true. However, I do think it's true that they may have had some influence on each other's work. Do you have any notion of his influence on the book? Your assumption is correct, both. He did not write the book, but he did. she did have some influence. They were friends, and they talked a lot, and he gave her some ideas. Truman Capote grew up in Louisiana. So he was familiar with, you know, uh, uh, he was um, he grew up in more working class, humble environments, whereas Harper Lee grew up in more upscale environments. But he gave ideas about how Southern blacks acted in certain, you know, certain places from his experience in Louisiana. So, so some people feel she got ideas for characters based on the talks with him, so to speak, which doesn't necessarily mean she wrote the book, or he wrote the book, but you know, so on. In, in that sense, that's like me saying, uh, you know, give you all an idea. Well, why don't you write your next paper on, you know, uh, uh, you know, how Hollywood has portrayed women. You know, and I might say you might want to get sexism, but as, if you write the paper yourself, well then yes, I might give you the idea, but the point is you did the writing. Now if I came and wrote it for you, that's ghost writing, so that's different than you actually uh, right. take it for. I, I think part of what, what helped fuel that rumor was just the fact that that was a rumor book. Right, and also too, exactly true, but also too, they also, the friendship declined, uh, it did not last. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for people think, uh, a couple of reasons, the major reason was I think that uh, Shuba Capote, um, was somewhat resentful of, of the success of the book. He wrote a book several years later in Cold Blood, which is a fantastic book, a number of, but it never, it didn't get nominated for any literary awards. It, it kind of was kind of uh, ignored. Uh, whereas, you know, he saw Harper Lee winning the Pulitzer Prize, uh, several uh, awards from Jewish organizations. Um, the, movie, the book was made to the movie. And Cold Blood was too, but he just saw this, uh, this woman, you know, so to speak, you know, his, I guess his fellow friend getting all this acclaim, he felt it on, um, and Cole, his book. And there, there was some, some people said there was some jealousy, he was unable to um, uh, accept that fact, and they felt the friendship disintegrated because of that fact. He should have gotten some credit for records of Tiffany's report in Cold Blood. Well, yeah, that was his book in Cold Blood was, but actually in Cold Blood put him on the map because prior to that time, Shuba Capote was kind of, he always had, there was a, he had kind of a cult following. I think upper class society, Jackie Kennedy, that crowd liked him, but he did not have that same mass appeal as to Kill a Mockingbird. He wrote a local, in local color, other voices, other rooms, which was his first book in 1948, you know, which was, you know, a dark seating book to deal with sexuality and things of that nature. But, but it was up until about Cold Blood that kind of really put him into the mainstream. Maybe Breakfast at Tiffany again. That was um, that was beginning to get him there, and that was made to a movie, you know, as well. But and Cold Blood was the movie. I mean, the book that kind of really put him to the mainstream, you know, with, with a large, a large audience. You know, he always had an intellectual cult following audience, but Harper Lee had that mass audience. That you know, was the distinction. Some over here, the hands over to you. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I was on a committee, um, a chairman of the committee of the International Reading Association for several years, and there was the list of hundred banned books, and what that. Did from my observation was make those books more exciting, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people really wanted to get them. And it was usually a um, religious group that would man the book or pull out the book. 
within my experience. Well, yeah, but if you tell somebody, you know, if you tell somebody, you know, if you tell, if you tell kids, you know, not to read it, you know, <laughs> with, that's why I went, you know, I've taken, just, I've taken um, at ETSU, I've taken graduate students, you know, here and there. And I was like I said, first of all, even undergrads, I said, I, the first thing I tell them, look, you're adults, I'm certainly not going to be running around checking up on grad students, where you are for the next couple of days, you know, I'm, you know, if you get in trouble, you get your the law, then you realize you got yourself in trouble, you know, I was saying my point is that, but I'm not something, I'm not going to, uh, you know, monitor, you know, uh, kids or adults, but at that time, particularly graduate students, even undergrads for that matter. But the point is, you know, that's why I never tell them not to go certain places or whatever, you know, even since I don't know that, because if you do, you can guarantee you someone, those are the places that are probably trying to go, <laughs> you know, for whatever reason, you know, so. But you're right, when you tell somebody not to do something or, you know, they, that builds up curiosity about certain individuals, so yeah, exactly. That's whether it's TV shows or, or anything of, the, of that nature as well. Somebody else had a question? I saw a hand up here somewhere. Yeah. As I was reading, I kept looking for the source of the title. And uh, I finally, you know, discovered it in a scene there. I believe it was uh, their aunt, Atticus's sister, mm -hmm. am I right? Who said, uh, well, the children wanted BB wanted, uh, guns. And I, because I was growing up in a small southern town. Mm -hmm. We shot birds with BB guns uh, as part of the hunting culture. I don't know whether I should say that these mm -hmm. days or not, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but at one point, I believe it's their aunt who says to them, "You can kill all the blue jays you want, but it's a sin to kill a hawkingbird." Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, do you, is there any deep symbolism there uh, that you know? Uh, Sums up the book, or do you? I, well, you could interpret you could interpret that in many ways, you know, in several ways. But I think that um, uh, I think the mockingbird primarily is uh, a blue jay is not seen as obviously based on the person speaking, not as uh, requisite, not as uh, noble, <laughs> you know, so to speak. A mockingbird is even and it's pretty, or even it's pretty exactly. So I think that's why I think that has a lot to do with it as well. Was it? They don't have a song. Beautiful voice. Right, right, right. Divine voice, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, a question I think somebody, somebody, uh, I think so, so, uh, we talked about earlier about the movie as versus the book. Those of you who've seen the book, uh, read the book, obviously know that's Scout. The book is Scout's in there, for the most part. Scout's narrating the book. Uh, the movie version, that's Atticus. Uh, the movie was focuses more on the latter part of the novel. The movie focuses on the latter part of the novel. And, you know, it's clear it's Atticus's movie. You know, Scout's in the movie, but it's Atticus's movie in the movie. And that's how I interpret it anyway, To Kill a Mockingbird. Whereas the book is more Scout. You know, so this, the book is more of a Scout narration. But I think that, and, and that in itself is um, uh, the case. There was talks about trying to, they wanted to, uh, this is true, <laughs> they wanted to remake To Kill a Mockingbird. They wanted us, uh, 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 they, uh, you can understand, I was like, oh, no, 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 don't do it. <laughs> you know, no, not, not by 21st century standards. If you did, be very, very careful. I think uh, some things are kind of better f left untouched, better left untouched. I don't think you can really do too much with it in um, this day and time. Although some people argue the movie A Time to Kill, which came out in 1996, was kind of a more updated version of To Kill a Mockingbird with um, Matthew McConaughey, Sammy Jackson, Sandra Bullock. Um, some people thought that was kind of a more modern day version of To Kill a Mockingbird. And you could kind of see that maybe more of a, a later version of it, but um, but I think To Kill a Mockingbird itself was a very, very, um, the movie itself uh, was very well done, and very, very engaging too, you know, as well at, at that time. One reading of the book would say that it's about white redemption. It gives, gives, gives white culture a hero, a, a person's soul and uh, integrity and honor and all the things that that quote you mentioned have. And it, it, yes, it, so it's it's about redemption. But you know, I can understand why the black community would the black community would not embrace a story about white redemption if that's what it is. I can see why Malcolm X would would, would make mark remarks about about to kill Martin Burks being uh, something for everybody. Well, again, like I said, you know, um, within the black community, you know, opinions vary. Within the white community, opinions vary. You know, no, no, no community was monolithic in their, in their opinion about the book. <laughs> but I think that um, I do see, uh, uh, at the time, like I said, you know, people, have, a lot of people now were talking about who may have initially had issues in the 60s and 70s with the book. I probably will look back, you know, now they're 30 some years, odd, odd years later, three decades later, they'll probably get a whole new um, perspective on the book. And, you know, I think because of age and everything else. Example, example, and that includes me. There was a movie that came out, um, talking, about, talking about myself here, there was a movie that came out in 1989 entitled Driving Miss Daisy. It was made into a play. 
And at that time, I did not like the movie at all. And because um, I just I didn't like what I thought it represented or nothing, but I noticed my older brothers and sisters who were in the thirties at that time, you know, so they, they did like the movie. And I noticed with blacks, it seemed to be such a generation of black. At that time, this was nineteen eighty nine. If you seem to be thirty or older, you liked the movie. Anybody who was twenty younger, you know, about twenty five or younger, did not like the movie. Or in late twenties, it was kind of ambiguous. And I, my father liked the movie, and I was wondering why. And I think, and I look back, and that's when I started getting into grad school in history. I wasn't still an undergrad, but when I look back and looked at the movie again several years later, in the late nineties, I had such a deep appreciation for the movie because I realized this was a lifelong friendship between a white Jewish woman in the South and an older black man in the South who came from totally different worlds. But this friendship grew over decades and decades. And it was like, you know, in that later, later scene, Jessica Tanny tells Morgan Freeman, you're my best friend in a nursing home, so to speak. And, I thought, and then you can look back and see how these people could be your best friends, you know, despite their, you know, she might have grew up in upper class society and others like that. But she realized that Hook was actually her best friend when all was said and done. And it was, she was, he was the one that was there for her. You know, a lot of her other friends were more or less pretentious, so to speak. And I think that um, it just showed this long friendship of people who came from different worlds who were somewhat distrustful of each other. I didn't even, probably even like each other too much in the beginning and had all these stereotypes about one another, you know, so to speak. And I, that's why, you know, I think if so much of this country happened between 1955 and 1970. That's why I think if you were 30 years older at that time in 1989, you had a genuine appreciation for the movie. But I could see somebody at my age at that time was in our early 20s and late teens saw it as being kind of, you know, um, um, uh, stereotypical, you know, Hope was not, Hope was not, um, uh, some people refer to him as a modern day man, mammy, and something, which he was not. Hope, you know, had dignity, he had pride in himself, he took care of himself. He, you know, he was, you know, he was a very, very, you know, a man who had dignity and held his hand, held his head high and everything else. But it took me, a, it took me a long time to, you know, when I started looking at history and studying it, to realize that. But for the, and you got to realize that time for an 18, 19, 20 year old kid looking at that, you did not see it that way, <laughs> you know, so. And so that's why I think when, we, when we're younger, that's why I think anybody should go back and look at books, you know. That's why I think, you know, I think it's a good idea, you know, for people to reacquaint themselves with the Kill a Mockingbirds and books like that, which people do. That's why I think these book clubs that are starting up all across the country are very good. Because I can't talk about the number of people who said now they've gone back and read books and book clubs and they have gotten such a different meaning from it now and how they have such a different attitude toward the book when they initially read it. And I think that is um, highly, highly important. I think when the older we get, a lot of times we see things differently than when we were, than when we were younger. That's why I think you can never ever say you can read a book once and be done with it because the book can give you different meanings every time you read it. You might come up with something you did not the previous time. And I think that's highly, highly important as well. Uh, was there uh, any, a, a question about the, um, uh, uh, any other questions in regards to um, any of the characters? Like I said, I'd be happy to entertain any more than anybody had, you know, that, um, you know. How many of you, go ahead. Well, I really appreciate the way that uh, Atticus was, his parenting skills, you know, and how he was able to keep his kids to be critical thinkers and to read. And the, but I think the uh, Reverend Sykes was also very good with that. I mean, he took very good care mm -hmm. of his children and made sure that they saw what was important and saved a place for them. And so I thought he was a strong character in that sense. He was, uh, he, and he was. I mean, there a number, like I said, a number of people. I didn't mention every character, but I think that, but yeah, he was very, very important in because he also was, um, you know, uh, certainly trying to focus his children to do, you know, to stay on straight and narrow and also to expose them to as much as he possibly could. And the world was very, very, very limited. You know, and I think that's, that's teaching within itself. Teaching is not simply reading, writing in the three R's. You know, teaching is education itself is learning different cultures, learning different people, you know, learning different environments. And I think that, um, and I think Hawthorne Harper Lee does that. Just by this book, you gotta realize in 1961 it was written. This was a world that was be, if you lived in Hollywood, California, if you lived in Greenwich, Connecticut, if you lived in certain areas of the country, this would be an education for you. Because these people you probably could not probably identify with. Even if you lived in Southern Alabama, if you lived in Deba, you probably identify with these individuals, but on some level, even there, the economic stratification, like I said, the class distinctions were so much there, were, were so you know, stark, that even though you may be familiar and know about, and you may have relative, closer proximity to these people, but the fact is you would not, um, it would still be a different world from yours, even though you may have resided in that certain region. That's why that's what I'm saying, I think the book was educational on a multitude of levels that way, with those race, class, Southern regionalism, and, you, know, you know, religion on some level as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did a good job there. Anyone else? Well, I think the genius of the book is that you're so charmed by these children playing and being afraid of Boo Radley. And it's so subtle that all of a sudden you're in the midst of this trial and this man standing. It, it just sneaks up on you, and you're sort of thinking, my goodness, this is, this is what this book is really about. But the, her charming display of the life of children uh, was 
uh, just what catches you. I mean, and, and you're in a grip before it, it's almost like scouts realizing how serious this is with, with her father. Well, like I said, the opening scene of the book, I mean, opening paragraph of the book, and that's why I use it in the talk. When I first read the book, the opening scene, I said, you know, when I just looked at it, and I sat down and read the book for like, I didn't read it all in one sitting, but I was able to read about, you know, just one sitting, about a better part of 200 pages, because I was like, I first read this, but I was like, this, the, the whole, the opening paragraph just engages you. I mean, it just, it just wraps you right into the, I said, I'm into the story already after the first two paragraphs, because I've never seen anything written so, you know, just so engaging, you know, you know, because like, you know, most of the books at the time didn't start off like that, you know, you know, she's talking about already her brother, her champ, and then, you know, that's the opening paragraph, and he is, I was like, I'm hooked already, I'm into this, I'm into the story, <laughs> you know, just, it, for me anyway, it got me into the story, and I think that's the key with a lot of people, you know, I think also, as I said earlier with the movie, uh, I think the opening scene of that movie, when you see those, I think that's a very, very striking um, scene, and for any movie to open up in the, in the way it did, and I think that helps, you know, um, it's a gift. They had both had a gift of keeping it, keeping it, keeping the reader engaged. And as I said, I, and I think the book was also um, some things just happened for whatever reason. I think the, the book. I do think the book is is very very important. But I do think I wonder if the book had been written in the late '60s would have had the same kind of impact. You know, I think it was written at the right time. I think you know I don't know if you can write a book like that as well today. I think some people have, have tried to emulate Harper Lee on some level, but not the same level of success. But I think I don't know if the book would be as successful. I think that's why I think sometimes the fact that she wrote that one book may have meant, may have been even better. And again, that was not, no, I didn't answer that, actually respond in that way, but I think the fact that she may have realized by just writing one book and that people talk about that book, you know, might have been more, as opposed she came out with two or three, because I think you can automatically, if her second book was, you know, we have, we have literary critics who love to you know, well, the sophomore jinx, you know, well, this is not quite as good as her first book, you know, and, you know, she's kind of, you know, where is in the words, and the killer mockingbird this is what Harper Lee seems to not have done the same thing in this book, you know, so I think, and I think it would have probably diminished from the, you know, right there wrong, it would diminish. So I think the fact that writing one book, uh, and the same with Ralph Ellison, you know, the fact that these people wrote these one books, look how people talk about them all the time, you know, whereas authors have written multiple books. Some people may still look at them, but they're still, well, this book wasn't as good as that book, and they don't, but the fact these, you know, that, that one book is probably, she might have been smart enough to realize that. I'm not saying she was being manipulative for anything, I don't want that to get across, but I'm saying she could have very well thought the fact that she, by having that one book out there, and people talk about this book on a half a century later, and still the staying power, selling over a million copies per year, and, da, 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 and speculating about it, that might have been a, also, a, a, could have been a strategy of hers, and, and, and it obviously worked well for her, you know, as opposed to maybe writing several multiple books. And maybe it was meant for her to write that one book. You know, so things are meant to be. You know, that I mean, it was just meant for her to write that one book. It's not there. You know, so I think that's you know something to consider as well. So, um, and, uh, any other questions? Anybody? Any any comment or comments? Com yes. I just like to make a comment about the title, "The Killer Mockingbird." It's just a sense of just killing any animal with a BB gun, and so. Uh, I would relate that the mockingbird to the main character that was accused of raping this white woman, and had he had no representation, he would have been killed too, or he would have found it in prison for the rest of his life. Right. That's what I got from the title. That's my interpretation. That's what I got too. Yes. Because the mockingbird had no defense either, so he had no defense. But a good point. Good point. Does anybody, does anybody know who played Boo Radley in a movie? Robert Duvall, Boo Radley, who played the character Boo Radley, Robert Duvall. At the very end of the movie, he, 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 he appears as Robert Duvall. <laughs> Boo Radley. And they did that at the very end of the movie. So that was kind of his, you know. Um, who played Brown Mule then? Who played who? Oh, he, he was a minor character. His name escapes me, <laughs> but you know, I can't remember. But I think that um, but I do the major characters. So one those one. Well, Gregory Peck was a star by that time anyway. So he was already a big star. But but you know, uh, Robert Duvall got him. She retired from acting. The young lady, Mary Badham, who was a girl at the time, a grown woman now. She would, she retired from acting at the age of fourteen. She only made two more movies after that. You know, so she just decided. You know, because they had several films lined up for her. ABC had a television show for her, or, or NBC one of shows, and she just you know, fourteen years old decided I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> you know, just like she just you know and um. And she didn't, she didn't, she never acted again. You know, so. yeah, so. I had just reread the book and I had, like, as I told you, read it in high school. Mm -hmm. And when I reread it, it all of a sudden dawned on me when it was supposed to have been taking place, like you say, in like the 30s or so. But somehow in my mind, I thought it was supposed to have been in that early 60s, 60s era. Mm -hmm. Because, you, you know, during those 60s years was when, you know, big civil rights. Going. So it, I, you know, I wasn't sure why she put it back into the 30s exactly. I mean, she could have been writing it about 
that current time, except a lot of things hadn't even they they changed us us a slow pace. And again, I go back as I said, Mrs. Peace here. I think in 1960, the fact that she, I think the, I think sometimes timing is very very crucial to anybody. Uh, can be very crucial to a lot of things. Not always, but in many cases, I think timing is very important. And I think the fact that she wrote the book in 1960 when it came out, I thought it was a. I think I think the book came out at a perfect time because I do believe it came out five years earlier. Uh, maybe 1955. I think it came out even six or seven years later, the late 60s. I'm not sure it would have had the same impact, or even you know in the 70s. I don't think it would have been. I mean, it probably would have got published, but I think it would have been a book that you know um, a few people may have known about. You know, you know, it might have sold maybe 100,000 copies, and might have got made into a movie. Might have, but highly unlikely. You know, but I think that uh, it would have. Well, I'm not saying we would totally ignore, but I don't think it would have had the same impact. I think the fact that it came out in 1960, what was going on in America at that time, you know, the ferment, the the, 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 the modernist rights movement was beginning to really start taking focus. You know, when um, the freedom rides and the sit-ins. You had John F. Kennedy in the White House, and this, you know, he was, he was a strong supporter of literature and writing poets to the White House. And you had the freedom rides throughout the South. You had Martin King Jr. You saw him on television, was still relatively in his infancy, you know, so to speak. So I think Don't Lie the Pill came out, you know, I think in all the issues he's dealing with gender and was going on, people were still becoming at least somewhat aware of race. So I think it, could, I think it was a perfect time for the book to come out. And I think they had a lot to do with success. Like, I do think time it can be very important. And I do think that the book came out at a perfect time, you know. Did she ever get any death threats on her? Because, it, you know, she was quite brave, I think, to voice that at that time. I don't know if it was a death threats, but she did get, she got a, a substantial, she got a, quite a bit, of, you know, hate mail, you know, from different people, you know, you know, she was betraying the South, how dare you, you know, how could you, how could you write something like this, and how could you, you know, you know, uh, well, I think one, one letter said, how can you have such a, and you know, uh, have such an endearing portrait of Negroes, and some people use the other word, you know, <laughs> you know, in the letters, of name. but I mean, it was, so you, she did have her, people did not like what she did, you know, so, and she also got criticism of liberals, that, you know, people were, you know, not, people didn't consider themselves racist, but, you know, and she got, you know, from all, from all over the political political spectrum. When anybody reaches that level of success, you know, you're bound to get your critics probably, no matter who they were. So, you know, conservatives probably didn't like it, those who wanted to maintain the status quo or thought you were giving, putting the South in a bad light, you know, reconfirming what people thought outside the region about the Southerners, as opposed to those who thought, you know, she was being very conservative toward the Negroes as well, you know. So she got various criticism. Any other questions or comments? No, anybody? I realize one thing too, and I hope you, I know this, and Mr. Sweeney knows this very well. I do talk very fast, <laughs> but uh, I think you probably, hopefully you understood most of what I said, and I think that um, I try to keep it, you know, um, uh, on, on that level, but um, I'm slower than when I first got here, so that's why, you, that's probably tells you I'm not from this part of the country, <laughs> somewhere, which is, I guess could be stereotypical in itself, but anyway, but, um, uh, so, but um, if there are no other questions, then thank you. <laughs>